Call the meeting to order. Please stand for the flag salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, will the clerk call roll, please. Councillor Bolin? Here. Councillor Elliott? Here. Councillor Fisher? Here. Councillor Grizzle? Here. Councillor Rieskamp? Here. And Councillor Scott? Here. We have the consent calendar. Are there any corrections or additions to that? Seeing none, the consent calendar is approved. We have the public comment section. Council welcomes all respectful comments regarding city's business. Citizens may address the council by approaching the microphone, signing in, and stating their name and address for the record. Each citizen is provided up to five minutes to provide comments. Council may take an additional two minutes to respond. The city clerk will accept and distribute written comments at a speaker's request. Are there any people that would like to speak? Any person? My name is um, Brenda Ogle. My address is 1073 Cherry Blossom Lane here. I, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear. What was your name? Brenda Ogle. Oh. Sorry, I'm fighting okay. a cold. No problem. Um, and did you need my address again? Please. 1073 Cherry Blossom Lane here in Lebanon. Um, I was just sent information that you might be discussing removing fluoride from the water in Lebanon Sweet Home. So I just brought information for that. I wasn't expecting to just come up and address it. I was okay. here in case um, somebody was here to speak against or speak for taking it out. Okay. But I did bring um, information if I can pass it out. Sure. And um, we do plan on addressing it. It won't be addressed at this meeting. We had mentioned maybe, but it, we've decided that it'll be at a later meeting that we'll discuss that. And uh, we'll, we'll have that out in the public. It'll be in the paper when we're going to discuss the actual issue. Okay. So then I don't necessarily need to stay today. Okay. Or should I stay in this? I, there won't be any discussion about that. Okay. So I appreciate you coming, though. Thank you. I'll fill this out and then I'll be finished. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Brenda. Is there anyone else that would like to speak from the public? Can I have that? You can, was the last one. You can have it. Yeah. Okay, seeing none, um, we'll move into the regular session, the Republic Services Review of the 2014 Proposed Fees. City Manager. <coughs> Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, before you today is the proposed uh, rate increases for public services for solid waste fees to the residents uh, and citizens of Lebanon. It's all part of a 2012 annual report in, in which Republic Services comes before the council to review the basis for their uh, proposed rate fees. I believe Kevin Hines and Julie Jackson from Republic Services are here to uh, tell the council exactly how that was determined and what it means. Good morning. Um, Kevin Hines, 5125 Elk Run Drive, Albany, Oregon. I'm Julie Jackson. I live at 630 Southwest 7th Avenue in Albany. Okay, so uh, uh, thank you for the time uh, um, that, that uh, you've given us here today. So we met um, with uh, Mr. Levesque a couple of weeks ago discussing the annual report. This is our second year presenting our annual report. And, um, you know, it's, it's a 22-page annual report. Our, um, you know, the reason for being here today was to summarize that report and then also have some discussion on uh, the um, uh, the rate increase that was proposed back in May of 2012. Um, so uh, a little brief history 
uh, in, in, uh, in May of 2012, it was in here for a, uh, a rate increase and then a um, uh, rate uh, methodology change going forward uh, for Republic Services. And it's what we had heard over the last um, uh, few years uh, a history of how, the, our, how our rate increases have been presented in the past was uh, typically every two to three years we'd come in for a rate increase, um, you know, of, of roughly seven, nine, eleven percent, you know, depending upon what the what the need was. And as what we were hearing from some of our jurisdictions was, you know, that that was, although you know, um, uh, agreed upon and passed, um, that was a little bit difficult to. Um, uh, to swallow, uh, looking at you know a nine or eleven percent increase. So was what they asked us to do was come up with a um, a process uh, that was that was um, more of an annual based um, rate methodology rather than you know every, every two to three years. So if you look on page sixteen of our annual report, and th this was I guess by the way this was presented last year and passed by the council, and I know since then we've. Um, you know, we have a new city manager, mayor, and, and several uh, counselors. So uh, I just wanted to give a, a brief descri description of uh, what that process was and, and um, you know, the, the reason why it was passed last year. So uh, again, looking at more of a, a smaller annual increase, uh, we came up with um, uh, uh, basically a CPI index. And this is something that we've, uh, um, we have uh, a pass with some of our other jurisdictions. We've gone through our legal departments, um, some other jurisdictions legal, and this is this is the um, uh, the process that we came up with. Um, starting so it, it's actually called a uh, refuse rate index. Um, partially, uh, sixty five percent of just our, our regular CPIU. Uh, and, and a disposal and a fuel component. And the reason why we've added the disposal and the fuel, fuel component, component is those are our two major, or our, our large, largest um, cost of operations um, in, in this type of industry. So we've taken, we've taken as you can see, just the, the regular CPI, we did that at 65%. We've taken um, a disposal fee, uh, and weighted that at 25%, and then a uh, fuel uh, component of 10%. And those are roughly what our costs are um, uh, of those of uh, those two areas. You can you can look at the chart down below how that is how to, that is weighted out and how we calculated the two uh, 2.6% uh, increase for this this next year. And um, looking at the, the the CPI piece. So 1.9% uh, uh, CPI change weighted at 65% comes out to the 1.3%. Um, the disposal piece of uh, a 4% increase in disposal cost weighted out at 25 is roughly 1%. And then the same with the uh, um, fuel of 3.2% weighted at 10% uh, comes out to 0.3. So that's how we've calculated the 2.6% uh, increase um, th this coming year. A couple things that we've, we've also added uh, into um, this index is one, we have, uh, we have capped our disposal cost at 4% uh, because uh, we, you know, we do own the Coffin Butte landfill. It is part of our, our, uh, our company. Um, so we, we have, we have um, put a cap in there of a, a 4% increase that, you know, that, that piece can increase more than, more than 4%. And then we've also put in a, uh, um, a cap of 10% on our margins. So, so this isn't just an annual increase that's going to go on forever and expand our margins. Um, we, we have capped that out at, at a 10% uh, also. And then the last thing that uh, we wanted to uh, um, put in here is we wanted to make sure that we still had the opportunity to come in um, for um, service level increases. For instance, if we wanted to um, increase our recycling programs, our yard programs to, uh, to a weekly um, scheduled pickup, uh, we could also come in and, and, and do that. So, I mean, that, that's a brief discussion. Uh, hopefully you've had an opportunity to take a look through this, but this is something that we presented, like I said, in, in 2012. It was passed by the council at that time uh, um, going forward, and I wanted to just make sure that, that everybody was aware of this process since um, there has been some, some changes in, in, in the council. 
so at that point I can take any questions and then Julie here is going to go over uh, the, the summary of, of our 22 page annual report I, I don't think you want to be going through 22 pages yeah I've got some questions you answered one of my questions that was about the ownership of Coffin Butte okay Coffin Butte's your single largest line item uh, both in your cost of operations and in your well, it's not quite your largest in your index change. It's 40% or 38% of your index change is Coffin Butte <clears throat> on your largest single line item in cost operations. Correct. You, can we get some information from you on the financial performance of Coffin Butte? In other words, why is it so expensive to, to put garbage in a hole in the ground? I mean, I know there's some operation costs. I'm just curious <laughs> what, the, what the net numbers yeah. there look like. As well yeah. since we're paying for that yeah. as well. Yeah, and, and that is and that is a great question. And and one of the things that we have we have offered up and some of our jurisdictions has taken us up on it is is, is a tour of the facility. Um, they just I mean it just kind of puts it for, perspective. <laughs> yeah. um, you know the, the cost of you know um, or I guess in the past of the perception of you know digging a hole and putting garbage in and burying it is is long gone. Um, uh, you know the, no, the, the I'm, I'm aware that there's a lot more to it than that. Yeah. Um, and then I guess my, my question will be, you're showing a 7.9% bottom line on this operation. What's the bottom line on that operation? Oh, with, with it being a separate entity, of my, I mean, I'm on the hauling company side, so I don't have that information. That's the, that's the number I'd like to see. Could I, okay. I'd like to see the same kind of information on Coffee Butte that we're seeing on this local operation. Okay. Okay. I can see if I can get that. Again, you know, it is owned by us, but it's a completely separate operation. I understand, but we're paying for it in a pretty big line item. Yeah. We can do that. Okay. Kevin, I have a question. Um, in, in talking with the city manager, uh, he was mentioning that you guys are going to start working towards some alternative fuel in your vehicles. We are, yeah. Is is that cost benefit going to be passed down to us? The savings. It, it will be to an extent. There is a large um, investment, a capital investment, to uh, to do that. Um, you know, with the trucks being you know roughly three hundred thousand dollars, and then the infrastructure of having having to put in a, uh, um, a fueling station. But yeah, at some you know at some point that will certainly be be passed down um, uh, to the to the customers. I mean, the fuel is much cheaper than than diesel fuel. Okay. So um, yeah, I mean, we will be seeing that savings. I guess one other quick thing I wanted to make. So those disposal costs doesn't necessarily represent just the landfill. It's um, it's our um, processing recovery facility. Uh, where, where we're taking our, our um, yard debris, our compo composting, and then also the, um, the re you're, you're recycling the, the cost of um, 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 transporting and, and, and taking that to market. So it's actually really three separate facilities in one line item. Yeah, it'd just be nice to understand a little better. Okay, absolutely. I have another question on recycling. Um, I'm familiar with Marion County's recycling program, and theirs is very robust, and they, they accept just about everything. Uh, one of the things that frustrates me is that when I'm recycling, I love to recycle, and, and when I'm recycling, all of the styrofoam goes in the trash, and that goes in the landfill. <laughs> and and there, there's no alternative for it. So is there any kind of an option that we can, that we can do some kind of a styrofoam recycling? Or, or, or recycling for other items that aren't accepted in the, because there's a lot of stuff that we just throw in the trash that you say we need to just throw in the trash. So one of the things that um, that I do is I, I have in the past I've worked with the recycling program and actually taught the master recycler program for Lynn and Benton counties for about five years, and you'll be using this. One? We um, styrofoam is one of those things. This is what I really tell people: stop buying it. Stop yeah. using it. We need to stop making it. Because while there are programs to recycle styrofoam, they are in Portland. And if you think of styrofoam, I tell kids it's like a plastic Cheeto. It's mostly air, a little bit of plastic. So hauling an entire truckload of styrofoam to Portland doesn't yield much actual plastic. There's a lot of controversy over whether the fuel and the resources required to get it to a recycler even benefit if there's a net loss in benefit for recycling styrofoam. So it's a really tough product. We know if it goes in the landfill in a million years it'll still be a styrofoam cup. That's the other problem with it. So it's a bad product environmentally and it's difficult to recycle. In the time that we've been here, that I've worked for the company about eight years, there have been about three styrofoam recyclers go out of business. So there are times when nobody can take it. It's a problem okay. and, and it's not one that there's a good environmental solution for right now. And another question, again, this is maybe a naive question, but uh, the bags that we get at the grocery store that have the little recyclable symbols on them, we can't recycle those. Is there a reason for that? 
There, there is. Um, our recycling, and I'd be happy to, to um, bring some videos and show you um, the process they go through, but it's a very mechanized facility where all the recycling is sorted because that big cart full of mixed stuff can't be recycled into anything. It all has to be sorted into light commodities. And so it's very mechanized. They spend a couple hours a day cutting plastic bags out of the machinery, stopping, cutting plastic bags out, and then starting back up again. Even though we ask people not to put it in and all the other folks who bring stuff to them ask not to put it in. So it just can't go into that process. But it can easily go to the grocery store or a depot where those are collected and they just have to be source separated and can't go in the cart. Okay. That's all I have. <laughs> Kevin, just, just to clarify, uh, under the, the May 2012 agreement, if the council takes no action today, it's essentially approving the, the rates that you're proposing and you're going to be able to notify your customers of that increase for next year. Yeah, correct. Um, so so basically it's it's um it's approving the um um the calculation of of the rates and then approving the um uh the the, the rate packet that we have in, in front of you today we will notify customers i think we have in there that we have to, we will notify customers within 30 days but again un under that prior agreement and i i haven't seen that prior agreement council doesn't have to take action to do that they they only can disapprove your proposed rates is that correct Correct. Okay. So just, just to clarify, that would mean that no action essentially means you're approving the rates, uh, the formula, and the numbers presented to you uh, under the prior agreement from May of 2012. Any other questions? These new rates, if we take no action, will, will become effective when? January. January 1st of 2014. And so we have till so January, we have till, till the end of the year to make an action, or do you need an action sooner than that? No, we need an action so we can notify customers. So when we were in here in May of 2012, <coughs> the council had approved this rate methodology going forward. Um, so it, it was it was approved at that time that this would be an annual increase based on the calculations being correct. Um, uh, it, was, it was somebody reviewing that. So so the so the methodology of the annual increase has already been approved in the in the past. It would be just a matter of making sure that the, the calculations are correct and you agree upon those. Yeah, I don't have any real quarrel with the, what I'm seeing as far as the methodology. I think that looks like a sound methodology, yeah. what I can tell. I would like to to get some of this additional information just so I have a sense of where the big numbers are before we say go. That'd be my, my sense. Is there a target date for collecting above ground more frequent? Collecting, excuse me, I'm sorry? Above ground. Debris, grass. Oh, yeah. I mean, that that is that that is why we 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 put this um, last paragraph in here. Um, yeah. I mean, we would be glad to offer offer that service, um, uh, collecting that on a on a weekly basis. Is that, is that what we're talking about? More frequent. Um, that is that is jurisdiction. Um, depending upon what the jurisdictions want. I mean, if that is something you're asking us to do, we would love to bring you a proposal and, and you know, a rate for adding that, um, that service. Absolutely. We, we, have off, um, you know, we have offered that in the past to some of our jurisdictions, and, and, it, and at that time, um, you know, that was just a service that uh, they didn't want to add. And you don't have a mechanism for people, individual households, to opt in or out of... Of, of uh, I want weekly, I want bi weekly. We, we don't just be because of the cost of that, what that would cost to run another truck yeah. Uh, separately. Yeah. Any other and questions? So, oh. so, our inaction today, we do nothing. You move forward and you start with your notification of. That, yes, okay. that, that, that is correct. And that, that, what, that is what was passed, what was passed last Right, year. okay. Yeah, going forward. But you do need to come to us every time we need yes and that, just that was to notify thing. us absolutely to do nothing <laughs> we, will be, we will be in here every year showing you the financials okay. showing you the calculations showing okay. our new rates um absolutely how much time do you need to notify your customer base we need, you start that like this next week with seeing uh, or for we january we will we, we need to because we have we have a um um bi-monthly cycle so we will need to notify customers the first of november and then other customers in december for the first of to be effective january i'm good doing nothing yeah. and having you escort barry through your facilities at a future okay. date we can certainly do that i yeah, yeah i don't want to go to, i don't want to go to coffin butte i've been there enough <laughs> <laughs>
on page 17 of the uh, pr proposal, you have uh, a statement in there that says the um, calculation shall be provided to the city in September 1st, 2013. Yep. Uh, and yes. were, did we receive those on? We did, yes. That's the yes. 30 days. And so the 30 days would technically run until October 1st? Um, yes, I, I dropped these off the first part of September. Okay. For, for your review and then for us to get in here, it, it, typically sometime in October for, for this discussion. And my memory of the way that this yeah. works is basically we've approved that this council has approved of the rate uh, increases every year based on the calculations. Yes. And we can only object to that based on a error in the calculations. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. Okay. So, I mean, I guess my advice to council is, is that unless there is a motion based on an error in the calculations, that no action today simply approves what we've previously, the council has previously approved, which is the modification of the rates based on the index that they provided. Um, so no action today provides them the go-ahead um, to proceed pursuant to the agreement that we've already made with them back in 2012. You know, I'm good with that. I don't think it's probably a big enough deal to, to try to hold this up. Uh, I would like to, like say, have an opportunity to review these numbers over the next couple months and maybe possibly based on that review, look at this one more time next year. But I don't see any reason to hold it up to, at this stage. Okay, great. And we'll, I'll stay in touch with Kevin and we'll get that information for you, Councilor Scott. And all the councilors will provide that to you. Okay. Any other concerns from councilors? Okay. Thank you very much, Kevin and Brenda. Appreciate it. So, just real briefly. Oh, I that's right. I'm sorry. <laughs> I have not enough for everyone. Maybe you want to share, and we'll just. Uh, this is kind of the happy, touchy, feely part where we talk about all the great things that have happened in 2012. Um, I will tell you that I just this week got the recovery rate, which is how we calculate what's been recycled and reused and composted and all those things for Lynn County, and we are again above 50 percent. I believe it's 51 percent for 2012. DEQ is always a year behind, but um, but that's great. I will tell you that. Benton County is at 46 percent. That makes you feel better. Yay! <laughs> they have a hard time with that, let me tell you. So I just want to briefly let you know some of the highlights of 2012. And, and one is um, that we held our second household hazardous waste event in Lebanon. Um, that was something that Lynn County and I think the folks in Lebanon were asking for. And so that has been a big success. Um, we've begun to collect food scraps from the Lebanon Hospital. They are really into that and they know that we have this program where we're composting food waste. So that's um, happening. Julie we're working is with Lebanon High School to certify them as a green school, which is a great program, helping them to reduce waste at the school and find ways to reduce waste and possibly cost as well. And then um, we have an, our annual spring recycle event here in Lebanon, our recycle roundup. Um, the next page just real quickly shows our um, efficiencies and so what it shows you is that we are, are um, hauling our industrial halls in more halls in fewer minutes. Oh, I see a typo, sorry on there. Commercial yards are being hauled. Um, more commercial yards of waste are hauled each hour and more residents are being picked up each hour. So while we focus on safety, that's our most important focus. We are also more efficient and we're getting more done in less time. So it's important to us to continue to do that and keep rates down and um, work for the folks who we work for. And then Kevin says this is a really busy, a lot going on on the next page. And there is, but it just has some numbers, sort of um, how many customers we have in Lebanon, how many participate in recycling. So 97% of all of our residential customers participate in recycling in Lebanon. I think that's a really admirable number and it gives you an idea how important that is to people. Um, for 2011, the recovery rate was 55%. So we've gone down just a little bit, but the state goal is to be over 50, and we're over 50, which is just great. Um, and what that tells you then is that the landfill rate was 45%, less than what was kept out of the landfill. And that is really a great thing. The tons recovered over here on the top right, 12,478 tons recovered. That is everything that was recycled for Lynn County. We don't really have a mechanism to separate Lebanon or Albany out of those. So it, those numbers always go in as a group. 
and then 10,428 tons were composted and converted to compost at our facility in Benton County. Julie, is there a plan to expand the, um, the composting to residential? You know, as Kevin said, that is one of those things. In order for us to offer food waste, we call it this food scrap program, and we're doing that, I think you're probably aware, in Corvallis and in Salem and some other places. Um, in order for us to expand that to Lebanon, which is, as Kevin said, we're happy to offer that, um, we have to go to every week. Instead of yard waste, we call it mixed organics now because it's yard waste with the food scraps. And we have to go to every week, and that's just simply to make neighbors happy because we don't want to have odors in the neighborhood. And if we went every other week, especially in the summer, that can be problematic. So that program has to become weekly at that point. I will tell you that in um, a survey we did in the Corvallis area, the single most requested program before we went to this was weekly yard debris. I think people, you know, you think you're not using it every week, but leaves in the fall and then I prune roses in the winter and you know all those things happen so it's a good program and it's certainly one we'd be happy to offer in Lebanon and, and if the, and if you added food scraps to that it kills me to to be you know to not have that and, I, and I'm not a gardener so yeah, exactly. I, I, I I would do nothing with it if I just did it myself so it kills me to just throw that in the regular garbage. I would love to. You know, and the really good news is we've gotten to a point where the low-hanging fruit is taken care of. We're recycling paper and plastic and cardboard and those things. So now we're looking for those other products that are a little bit harder to work with. And, and food waste is one of those. We know that about 20% of what goes into landfills is organic in nature. And a lot of that is food. And so, yeah, I think there's a lot to be said about us putting those into a compost facility and doing something beneficial with it. What is your rough guess of what it, how that would impact fee wise to a residential customer? A dollar or five dollars? I mean, what is? You know, I, I think I think we're probably around the three to five dollar range. Um, again, that it depends on um, the density of, of the area, um, how big, um, uh, how many customers participate. Um, but that that would be something that you know, if the council was was um, looking at, that we, we could come back and give you a proposal on that. Um, uh, timing on that would be, you know, probably, you know, the February, March, April time when people are starting to use their yard debris carts again, trying to get a rate like um, a rate passed right now when you know people aren't using yard carts as much but we, we could certainly come back um, you know maybe in Q1 do you have a, a mechanism in. to um, say uh, and this may be way out there but to um, survey Lebanon residents to say if we could if we went weekly yes. and we included food scraps would that have enough value to you to increase your rates by X amount roughly um, you know, I, I hate to increase people's rates. I, I, obviously, it's a it's a tough time, and and yep. that would be not necessarily very popular. But but I would pay three dollars more if I could do that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, we could we could do a survey. We could work with the city of Love. I mean, we could figure out a way to get a survey out to our customers. Um, and, and you're right, and see if that's something they'd, they'd be interested in. I would love absolutely. to see that. I don't know about anybody else. I think a survey makes a lot of sense. I would support a survey. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we'll certainly we'll certainly do. I mean, just for the pure fact that I mean, even in the summertime, you can just put your yard cart out weekly. <coughs> just right. For, for that mm -hmm. reason. My yeah. husband gets really cranky. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think you're right. We all think it would be a really great idea to compost, but not everybody has time or the inclination to do that. And and this make it's just like recycling. This just makes it easy, and it comes to the curb. So we like that program. Um, the next page just shows you a sampling of how many tons of different materials were collected in Lynn County. And um, that, that is pretty much it, other than just to say that we appreciate the opportunity to come in. Um, one of the things we really like about this refuse rate methodology is that we don't come every three years just asking for a handout. We come in and we can talk to you about the possibility of a survey or, you know, just find out what else you're thinking about. And um, and, and I wanted to mention about CNG trucks, too, because we are putting a fueling station in our Corvallis facility and um, we have trucks coming 
in the first quarter of 2014 and and we know that that's something that will move this direction we um, just want to congratulate you on that the new alternative transportation center it is a great program and we one that we hope to take advantage of the graduates from with those new trucks and with those technologies coming to our company too awesome. good any other questions Thank you both. Excellent. All right. Thank you. Any items from council? Okay, seeing none, we have one last opportunity for public comments. Anybody from the public would like to speak? Okay, seeing none, I'll adjourn the regular meeting and we'll move into the work session. Okay. And our first up will be the water and wastewater utility update by Ron. I forgot to give you these earlier. These are just kind of pictures of the slides. Here we go. Just the styrofoam. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, Ron. I appreciate you printing those out. Thank you. Oh, yeah. You can't see it. It's back there. I do have eyes in the back of the head, but not. Oh, <laughs> Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor and City Council. Um, we're here today to kind of give you an update on where we're at with the uh, water treatment plant process. In other words, trying to get a new treatment plant design started. Um, okay, you click it into the. Uh, there we go. I should be able to through the PowerPoint. Jamie, I'll help you. Okay, so what we, what we intend to cover with you is the background, basically uh, how we got to where we are right now. Um, project funding, what our funding picture looks like based on where we're at with rates right now, um, what we perceive to be the direction we're headed. Um, looking at the O&M costs, what the operations and maintenance costs are going to be for the new plant, um, some options that there may be there. Um, give you an idea of the sub-consultants that Corolla Engineering has proposed for this project. And uh, go through a summary, basic summary with you, and then hopefully questions and answers. And, and keep it informal. Any questions you got, just hit me with them and we'll, we'll work through that with you. And the idea is just to kind of give you an update on where we're at. So, uh, With that, we had consensus uh, at the August 14th meeting from Council to start negotiations with Corolla Engineering. Um, Staff has been very involved with the development of the scope uh, of the project. Um, we went through and we've had multiple meetings with Corolla to, you know, go over size, uh, various things, utilities, what we want to locate, what we want them to look at doing, uh, all the different options there. Um, the initial scope and fee uh, that was based on our input, basically our input, and with Carollo guiding that, uh, didn't fit within the current funding scheme that we have right now. In the rate structure that we have right now, that, that means not implementing the next 15% rate increase. So we're, we're trying to keep it in this box right now of that three fifteen percent rate increase with the possibility of some smaller inflationary going through. Um, that's what we're really looking at. That's why we're we're going back and forth and negotiating with Carollo, um, trying to find a plant that fits within that framework, as opposed to just saying, well, the original thought process was to do four 15% rate increases. Um, 
we're trying to see if we can do the project within the 315s that we have right now and make that happen. Um, so that, that's kind of in a nutshell where we're at with them. Um, whether we can or can't remains to be unseen. Um, you know, there, there may be some decisions we have to make, and, and I'll move through that as we as we go. But uh, so we've asked that they come back to us, uh, and one of the things that we're doing um, with them is to uh, look at look at different scoping items that they can bring down. Also, we have developed a. Uh, uh, a small contract with Corello, I guess is the best way to put it, uh, to take out some of the uncertainties. Some of the uncertainties that we don't know right now are the geotech work. How much excavation are we going to need to do for footings and, you know, is the material good? Um, utilities. Well, we know we've got at least four to 5,000 feet of water line, big, big diameter water line to install in order to connect our new plant to our existing system. Uh, what are the impacts throughout the rest of the system? I mean, are we going to have to upsize a pipe on Vaughn Lane or, you know, are we going to have to upsize a pipe up north of town somewhere just to maintain pressures, system pressures? And then the model will know that. So that's another thing that they're working on for us right now under this small contract. Um, you know, and then, uh, like I said, the structural fill. Um, they're working through <coughs> that process and then the pretreatment process a little bit. And then once we have some of those bigger questions, at least an idea of what the answer is, then we can develop a scope that hopefully fits within the percentages that we have right now. That's the idea, is, is to keep it there. So without doing that, uh, there's so many unknowns that what you end up getting is, a, is tagged on with a pretty big contingency to your project. And you know, likely, we would do the same as staff, you know, uh, not knowing what is out there and what we're going to build, uh, you, you have to account for those. Um, so at some point, you know, after we do uh, negotiate down a contract and get to where we fit, we're either A, going to fit within this framework, or B, have to make some pretty serious decisions. Um, some of those are going to include, you know, um, the size of the initial plant. Uh, I think one of the things that we're hoping to accomplish with this is to get a six MGD plant out of this right now, initially. Now, we don't need six million gallons today, but we want to be, I guess for lack of a better term, shelf ready to have six million gallons right now. Uh, that means all the plumbing fixtures and whatnot in, maybe not as many filters in place, uh, because likely the plant would run a little more efficiently at 4 MGD right now, but we still want to be capable 6 MGD right now. Um, I, I think that's important um, to, to go there. So that's a decision that's going to have to be made if we can't get there within that funding mechanism that we have in place right now. Uh, you know, future growth, which ties right back into that. Um, design of the building. You know, there's several different building designs. We could be real basic, I'll call it a hangar style building, um, basically look like a shop. Um, or we can go with a pre-engineered building. Both of those, um, the cost differences are, are pretty substantial. Uh, the O&M pieces to both of those is pretty substantial. Uh, one of the things with an engineered building, you can put a crane system in that helps pull pumps and, uh, you know, mix the ease of operations, you know, so th there's a different different things that you can do with the different types of buildings. So that's another thing that we're having Corolla look at in this minor contract that we have with them. Um, and then future regulations, uh, you know, we've got to have adequate room and think through uh, what the future regulations are going to be. Um, you know, the regulatory agencies rarely don't make any more regulations, you know, so I mean obviously we're going to be you know, what are we treating for next, you know? So we have to kind of think through some of that stuff. And it all impacts the price of the project, you know? Um, so we're Ron, trying to take some of the unknowns out of that. Ron? Yes, ma'am. When you're looking at um, architecture of buildings, yes. I think it's important, and I'm, I'm sure you're cognizant of this or aware, or, but I would think it would be a priority which building would last longest. I would hate for us to as a council to cut absolutely cut now and 30 years from now not having had the foresight to have a, a you know that our 
you know, my kid is now having to face this same conversation because we didn't have right. we didn't have a good enough right long term plan. And that's and that's where the decision making from from this body is going to have to come into play. Uh, our hope is that we can we can come in, build this plant within the framework of the dollars that we have now. I mean, that's that's the ideal situation, uh, and that's what we're really working hard to pin these costs down so that we know if we can do it. Because the last thing we want to do is either A, tell you we can't do it and it turns out we could have, or B, tell you we can do it and get to the construction bidding process and go, we can't do it. Um, so we're really trying to narrow those costs down right now, you know, and, and that's, that's, that's hard to do uh, with a project this size, um, yeah. you know, especially with some of the unknowns. But the building, you know, that, that is a good point, and um, that's another decision that, you know, the, this body can definitely make. Uh, we'll give you the pros and cons of both of those, you know, I mean, like I said, they both have their own M, you know, some some things are, you know, we can build a pretty basic building out there and yeah, it looks all right, you know, or we can do a little bit nicer building. Uh, obviously, um, we're not looking at the uh, Taj Mahal type building. We're looking at something functional, um, but there's functional and then there's down here, you know, so so we, we, we'll look at that and th that's definitely something we're, we're taking a look at. Um, so back to unknowns. Uh, your next slide there. Um, the intake design, that's another big one. Um, right now, Albany's under the FERC regulation, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Uh, that's changed the status on the canal a little bit. With them running their hydro plant, um, they come under new regulations, one of which is, uh, you know, we're a sole source, our water is sole sourced off the Albany Canal. Uh, so this FERC committee determines that it puts Albany in a higher class. So what does that mean? Uh, I don't really know, but I think, you know, we could be looking at a, a little more substantial intake than we were originally thinking as staff, you know. I mean, what we'd really like to do is a box culvert design that pipes it over to our side with some pretty basic stuff out there. Whether we're going to be able to do that with Albany or not, obviously, We'll have to wait and see. So there's there's more costs there that we don't know the answers to. Um, geotechnical, that's coming soon. Connecting water lines, I think, you know, once we run the model, we'll have a little bit better handle. Um, your building type, we've kind of covered that. Uh, Pre-treatment. Right now, uh, we're looking at this and we're thinking that we don't have a whole lot of need for pre-treatment. Um, that being said, we won't know the exact answer to that until all the water chemistry is taken into account with the membrane suppliers that we actually work with and whether we need to pre-treat up front. Our initial stab at it is no, we don't, which is a good thing. Um, you know, if, if anything, it would be very minor. Uh, it's not like we need to build another treatment process on the front end of our plant uh, prior to going to the filter. <coughs> Um, let's see, oh, and then I, obviously I threw in there need for additional treatment uh, to meet future regulations. Um, what's that look like? I mean, what, a couple of things we're looking at, um, we want to leave room in the plant for UV disinfection for, uh, you know, things that come up and, and uh, we're not necessarily going to put it in right now, but we definitely need to leave room. Not a big thing. Pre-treatment, if they change the pre-treatment rules on us, we want to make sure we leave enough room up front in the plant to where we can accommodate something to cover that so that it's not a complete redo uh, on the plant. So there's a lot of things to look at there. Is that, that. that kind of thing, is that primarily just a matter of making build, building a little bit bigger? Or yeah, and or, or having it thought through to where um, you can add something. It doesn't necessarily have to be in that building. It could be in a, a separate building, uh, but just something, some way, somewhere in the flow. yes, somewhere in the flow, somewhere in the process, that we can do that. There's primarily physical space to allow for. Absolutely, uh, and we start allowing that physical space. Some of it, obviously, in the building. Your building grows. At, you know, you don't want to just make a small box and hope that everything fits in it. At the end of the day. Uh, but it's not. To, we're not talking like major new valving that is there as a contingency valve. Or something like that, or something. Well, it could be. Yeah, I mean, I, those regulations. What are they? What are they in the future? You know, I mean, we don't know. I mean, there's talk of uh, treating for 
uh, uh, like your your prescription drugs, you know, out of rivers. You know, how, how, what what's that process look like? You know, whether we get there or not, I don't know. But these are the things that we need to look at as we size the building, so that it's not just set like this, so that we can actually put more process in it if we need to, and it's expandable. Weren't we originally when we set out on you know the, the talking of the new facility? Wasn't the target like eight million gallons? Yes, six to eight, six okay. to eight. So, so I, I think we had a, we've had multiple meetings. Uh, seems like we meet on this all the time and are going through the numbers. Uh, what ideally, what we would look at right now, I think, if if we had a perfect world and everything, the stars and the moon align, which we're hoping they do. Uh, we get enough filters in our plant to run four million gallons right now, but the racks, and, and I'll have to bring some pictures and show you, the racks are set for six to where all we got to do is screw canisters on, and we've got six million gallons right there, ready to go. And then you leave ample room to bring another skid in to get you to eight million gallons. But if you start reading through the master plan and looking at our growth rates, and it's probably, if you stayed on the same growth pattern we are today, I mean, it might be 40, 50 years before we need that 8 million. But it would, wouldn't it be true to say if we went, we had a growth spurt um, pre-2008, uh, from everything I'd heard 10 years prior, that was a very unanticipated growth spurt, and it was fairly significant. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if that were to happen again, we would meet those numbers very quickly, I would think. Probably not. Probably well, not. another question I have: this 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 facility will have duplicity in it, yes. right? Okay. Yes. Um, so if if half the plant went down in a six million gallon, would we would have approximately three million gallon capacity, or is it that simplistic? Depends on which process went down. I th I think what what these are, and, and it's hard to picture. Their their filter. I call them skids, but basically they're, and you can array them however you want, but they're going to be, let's say for our purposes, they're going to be in increments of 2 million gallons per skid. And what they are is individual filters that can, you can put enough in for 2 million gallons capacity for each of those, or you can alternate and maybe you have one point whatever million gallons, which is what we're proposing for three of them, so that we could jump to six real easy. Uh, and then you would have all your piping headed off so that you could jump to eight, but you wouldn't necessarily need to put the skids in. Uh, our thought on that, after reading through this stuff, uh, the turnover rate on the on the filter on the membranes themselves is about a 10 year life cycle. So to put that additional eight in, we will have the room for eight, but we wouldn't necessarily put that in right now as a capital cost because we would just be replacing it without even even using it. So it would just it would be fitted that way. Now that that's what we're shooting for. Should we do something different than that? Obviously, this body's going to need to make a decision. Okay. Well, part of what I'm getting at is we have seen four million gallon days, mm -hmm. and I just was trying to get a picture how close. You know, it, it makes me uncomfortable being too close to our, our present demand without thinking a little further ahead. Yeah. Uh, that's all. So a couple of things that, that hopefully uh, we're doing that will, will alleviate some of that, that worry, which, which it's been a worry for us. We're putting 4 million gallons of storage on South Fifth Street. So we've increased our storage capacity by 2 million gallons, which there, that in and of itself, hopefully we don't have to run the plant even on a peak day. Right now our peak day is 3.5, 3.8, or a three-day max day you know, is about 3.8. Well, we should have enough storage with the 6 million gallons that we've got to not have to run the plant that hard. You know, we can catch it up a little bit slower. Now, if you've got 4 million gallons set there, with the amount of storage that we've got, um, you know, it's uh, you, you should you should have ample ample filter room to do that. Now, let's say that we got in a situation where um, all of a sudden we were seeing, you know, global warming actually hits and we're doing 4.5 million gallons a day for our peak days. Um, that's why we want to be set to six 
so that we can call up whoever our membrane manufacturer is and say, hey, I need some more filter units. They ship them to you, you screw them on, and all of a sudden you're making six million gallons. Your, your plant capacity has, has grown to that. That's the idea, um, is, is to have that be in place. And they'll be on skids. So back to your question about is there redundancy, yes. So I can take one skid offline and still have potentially four million gallons capacity. Yeah. Uh, so and you would physically have space in the building. I think I just heard you say to go to eight. Yes, Without that's our goal. Okay. That is our goal. And, that, and that's, you know, we're, like I said, we're, we're putting this all in this box of can we do what I'm talking to you about right now in the rate structure that we have? And that's, that's what we're shooting for. So, okay. so Ron, I just want to make sure I'm understanding how this plant works. As I understand it, the, the, the gist of this is we've got infrastructure, you know, pipes and stuff going to the site, yep. utilities going to and from the site. We've got a physical building, we've got an intake off the canal, and inside the building, connected with some sort of manifold, are these skids of filtration units. Correct. So that's so the skids are the filtration units, the treatment yes. units. Yes. So, it will go through a pre-screening and some stuff like that, but yes. But generally, the so you know, if we had an extra skid sitting in the warehouse, you know, if one skid for some reason blows up, we would stick a skid in and replace it if we had to or something. Yeah, you would call your manufacturer and get one. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. With with some with some mechanical plumbing, but yeah, that, so, that's essential. Yeah, but once you, once we've done. Once we've done the, the infrastructure of getting stuff to the site, getting the site built, the actual filtration capacity is relatively updatable. I would say we're shooting to be updatable to 8 million gallons. I think once you get past 8 million gallons, I think your infrastructure within your distribution system... Yeah, then, then system, the infrastructure itself starts uh, to become a different issue. You're, you're talking a whole new ball of wax at that point, sure, and, and our thoughts on that, unless you have just a humongous growth spurt, that's a long ways off. Right. That's no, a that's long ways off. Even I'll probably be dead before we need eight. <laughs> I well, gotta I imagine. Well, I hope not. Well, could be. I mean, you guys, well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so that's kind of the unknowns. I mean, there's a lot more unknowns than that, but that this it kind of gives you a snapshot of what what's going on. Um, next thing, and I think we've kind of touched on it, is the project funding. Uh, in 2000, that uh, says 2007, but that master plan was actually completed in 2009. Um, we had a cost estimate of about $25.5 million, which included a 30% contingency. Okay, that included the engineering price. That's in the master plan. Um, also included a on-site on at-grade reservoir uh, and some other things. Um, so paring that all down, um, you know, you're, we've had probably six years of inflation, close to six years of inflation. Um, we've got uh, three of our four 15 percent increases that we've implemented uh, in order to do this piece of capital. So we're we're tight. We're it's going to be tight. Uh, I think right now. We won't know the answer to that until we get some information from this preliminary, preliminary stuff back from Carollo. Uh, and once we know that, why then we can look at it and we can have more discussion if necessary at that point. What's um, your time frame do you think that you'll know more? Uh, we got the scope and the uh, small contract that we're doing with Carollo back today. Um, I have staff back at the office right now developing the engineering services. So this afternoon? Yes, and yeah, well, we'll get it to them. They intend to have a work session with us like uh, December 4th, so something like that. And then we would be looking at December 20th for final, so we, we'd have some ideas. And then, you know, the big contract with them for the design would probably be January, February. I'm significantly worried about, you know, we, we talked, we, <laughs> we debated long and hard about whether we would sure. rate increase last July. Right. And until we had more information, I wasn't comfortable. And Wayne argued for at least a 5 8% just in case, so that if we did have to do the second 15, then it was only another 7. And, and that was a compelling argument. And I'm, it's, it's going to break my heart to be wrong on I, that. I still, I still think it was probably the wi a wise decision by council to do that. Because to be honest with you, I can't sit in front of you and tell you I need it if I don't know I don't need it. And and we need to we need to 
to work this stuff out so that we know those costs. I think that's I think I think that what you did was fair and, and that's what it should have been uh, in my opinion but that's just my opinion um, I don't think it's going to come to the 15 percent I think we're going to be able to, to do it under that I uh, you know at a minimum you can see what I put in there uh, we're proposing right now um, that we're probably be looking at a minimum of the three percent over the next two years and that inflationary uh, you just heard it from basically the allied waste people as well um, you know they're trying to keep up with their inflationary costs that three percent has nothing tied to it other than what we looked at as you know how do we maintain our capital program mm -hmm. uh, you've got another six to seven million dollars worth of infrastructure out there that and that and that's not that's not a bloated number we've actually sat and looked at these numbers for lines that need to be replaced that we're having issues with um, and we've said well how do we get there over the next 10 to 15 years uh, and our goal is to have four to five hundred thousand dollars left over after we've paid the debt service on this new treatment plant so that we can start tackling those plus you've got another reservoir on Grant Street that's just going to need to be replaced at least seismically updated at some point uh, so, you know, that, that, that's kind of where we're at, um, you know, and, and how we're uh, defining where we're at financially right now. Um, Rob and Jason and I and, and Mike Trippett have uh, spent hours uh, writing this stuff on the board and going through different scenarios and, and how this works. And basically what we came down to is, you know, we have to have the ability to pay our debt service. We have to have the ability to cover our fixed costs, staff, O and M, uh, you know, just your everyday costs and what what those are. And we've got to be able to uh, maintain our system that we have, and we've got to have a capital program at the end of the day. What we don't want to do is uh, try and do this uh, in the funding that we have, and in three years tell you you've got. $3 million worth of water lines that just failed. Um, guess what? We need a 20% rate increase now to cover those. So we're, we're trying to weave and dodge and, and, and make all this work within what we have here without having to go to go back to the rate payers to get more money. What would what be nice is to, to have a nice steady increase. And, and then if you did miss a year, it's, it's probably not that big a deal. But I think for now, what we're looking at is, is definitely the next two years. Um, Ron, what kind of methodology you guys use to project costs of these projects? Uh, Are, do they differ? Or do your methodologies differ from a major project like a water treatment plant or a reservoir as opposed to your water lines? In terms of, in other words, you just look back and say, over the last ten years, we paid this amount for contract to do, you know, X amount per foot or per mile to put water lines in, and that's it's just strapped like that way. Oh, or we, we, how do you actually keep, do that? We keep it daily. I mean, daily. I say daily. Um, you know, we take all of our current cost trends and we, we keep those and, and we move them forward. Um, so you add a percentage, you add, you know, two and a half percent for inflation per year. Uh, some years that, you know, you, you look at, so you move it forward that way. I know a number of years ago, the City of Lebanon had a small water line replacement uh -huh. team. Mm -hmm. And I know that um, for if, if the data that I've been given or been told about is accurate, that that team was was running water lines up to what six eight inch kind of diameters yeah in that ballpark mm -hmm. and what i understand is that that team was able to to beat contracted type construction costs on those water lines by in the 30 to 40 percent range and that was you know i'd like to see, i've been told that that data exists there at the city in some historical fashion but is it 30 to 40 um, percent yeah, I have, I have. and I, I mean i can share with you where i got that sometime but um and and somehow you know i've got reason to believe that's probably not inaccurate because i've seen other projects that have that similar kind of performance and so i'm just curious what we could look you know, for one i'd like to look back and just real, find out if that's really true I mean, I don't want to sit here and make a big conversation about something that's not true. Sure. But sure. So, you know, I have been told that from a reliable source that that was about the numbers we were running, and I, you know, and over about a five-year period, as I understand it, that, you know, that we, team was in place. We used to do the designs for the small waterline crew as far as costs. Uh, they ran their own costs. You know, that that came yeah. out of uh, Rod Selm ran most of that program. Um, so, 
so take yourself back to this number right here, um, the four to five hundred thousand a year. Um, that's basically what that that small diameter waterline crew had was four to five four to five hundred thousand a year. That covered staff, that covered equipment acquisitions, equipment acquisitions materials. and materials. Mm -hmm. uh, they did probably, I'd say, four three or four thousand feet a year, basically of small diameter pipe. Uh, water line, yeah, it's probably comparable. Um, you know, you get a contractor. Can we beat a contractor uh, put installing water line? Yeah, probably, probably. But you have to look at it in, in this sense: if you hire staff and you hire, let's, let's say, for instance, I go out and hire four staff. Um, and and I'd, I'd need to definitely do the math on this, but if I hired four staff, I would need to make sure that I kept those staff busy and I had enough work to keep that staff busy. Uh, no, I understand that concept as well. All, all day. But if you look day. at our capital improvement project for just, just treated water, and you know you can probably give me more accurate numbers, but if I remember correctly from, from the plan I read, the master plan, over the next, and I forget the, the life of that plan, but I think it's like, what, 10 or 15 years from now is what the plan projects to. I think the number for capital improvement projects was in the neighborhood of 44 million for, for treated yeah. water. And of that number, that includes the treatment plant and some other big projects. So sure. I'm thinking in terms of water lines themselves of up to X number size, not just small. But you know, I was in the impression you know, roughly two thirds of that number, you know, half to two thirds of that number was for water lines and stuff, I, as opposed yeah, to probably. major projects. Probably. And if that's true, and if the people I've talked to that were involved with that project, I, I, I asked the question, I said, you guys are doing small lines. I said, could you guys handle big lines? Well, if we had some, a little bit bigger equipment, some bigger shoring and a few other things like that, yeah. Um, and if there's a 30% number there, well, we're talking some numbers that are worth at least exploring. Yeah, and we can do that. I mean, ORSs, ORSs will, will dictate what we can and can't do. Mm -hmm. um, I think we can... Uh, do our own work up to one hundred twenty-five thousand uh, dollars before we have to go to and and Trey, we'd have to look at this uh, on what it is. I mean, I'd I'd have to go back to the ORSs uh, and see. Well, yeah, I, I'm not missing making do. a recommendation today. I'm saying I'm just asking to maybe have yeah, a and, conversation. Yeah, and and actually, uh, Dana and I and Jason have talked about it. So you know, we haven't really sat down to be honest with you and put uh, any numbers to it. Um, you know, so that's definitely something that we could we could take a look at. Um, uh, you know, you got, you got to factor in equipment costs, sure, all that stuff. That. Too, but it, so. you know, if you're talking twenty million dollars over fifteen years, the equipment costs are starting to get pretty affordable. Yeah. If the if the, if sure. the numbers are that I've been given are not far off. No, I I think that was a, a fair program. That that program was uh, was disbanded. I, I remember when when we did it, uh, basically looking at future needs being large diameter and the treatment plant. And we gotta collect all of our capital that we can collect right now and start putting in that direction. Um, that was the mindset at that point. And I think it still is at this point. You know, I mean we need to we need to I mean there's a lot of little lines that need to be uh, addressed as well. But um, right now our focus is primarily on that treatment plant and, and some of our big diameter stuff. And fix when you say big diameter, diameter, give me a, 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 a 12 to 16, 12 to 16 inch, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and versus an eight, right? Versus six. Uh, and what's the equipment requirement difference for doing that in the same fashion? Uh, it's primarily equipment as opposed to skill level, right? I mean, I think I think we've got the equipment internally to do that. We've got our own excavator. We've got. Um, backhoes. I, I believe they did all that with a backhoe, but that was a smaller. I don't know if you'd do 12 inch with a backhoe. Yeah, we'd use an excavator now, and we have a wheel loader, so right. we're set up for the projects. And we do, we do find ourselves doing some of these. Yeah, and we do, we do to help things along. Uh, I think we're looking at doing that even with the plan. Some aspects of that. I guess my basic take, without making you know, a proposal, but. What I've observed of certain city staff departments, you guys and others, is you guys have capabilities way beyond what some of the things we ask of you. And I just think, you know, okay. Well, we're actually management. doing them. You know, I mean, we, we did the Filbert Street water line. Where we've done a lot of storm sewer replacements with our guys, uh, you know, because not, it's not a big capital area. Um, we've done 
uh, street repairs, huge street dig outs. Mm -hmm. uh, and like Jason said, we're looking at, uh, with the geotechnical end of this, if let's say for some reason the geotechnical came back and said you got to over excavate six feet for your building pad, uh, we talked and we would do that internally uh, because that's a huge cost to have that contracted and hauled right. off, you know, where we could do it uh, as time allowed and, and got it done. So I think we are doing some of that. Uh, it may not be as known, maybe, I guess. Yeah. Uh, it'd be the, the, the way to put it. But we don't have a. Well, look at uh, the park. Uh, Christopher Columbus Park, same thing. Um, two years ago, we would have probably contracted that out. You know, whereas we had our guys in there with graders and cats and excavators and dump trucks and, and getting that project done. So. I, th I think we are doing that to a degree. The question I think you have is: is it, is it cheaper to take on a m more of that? And well, I think it's worth that's exploring. What Dana I mean, I understand you, yeah. you know tackling something like a water treatment plant is probably not something you want to do that. Well. Yeah, and I don't. Th I don't think we but would. I think we could that. do pieces of it. Yes. Some of the some of the utilities to it. Yeah. yeah. Some of the excavation on site. Some of the landscaping things. That I just think it might be worth taking a good hard look. At you. you know, we're. Just we're discussing treated water this morning. You also got wastewater. You've got storm sewer. You've got a variety sure. of things. You got street surfacing. You got a variety of things that a related set of capabilities could tackle. Yep. And that, you know, might just be worth taking a good hard look. At and that across the board. We intend to. Yeah. Would we have the ability to do that? Or would we have the manpower to do that without sacrificing other services in the maintenance department or the? I mean, well, is that that seems like a. Current, Man power intensity. Staffed, something's got to stop while we're doing doing sure. those additional duties. Well, but if you're going to tackle, well, it's it's just you have to look at the whole thing in, in broad scope. You may want to upgrade your manpower level at some level, but again, I'm not ready to suggest this is what we do. I think I'm asking for just some conversation and exploration. To this point, I'm not, I'm not ready to make a recommendation by a long shot. To this point, we've been able to absorb it and just keep shuffling things down the line and piling more on the on the crews and they responded to that at some point there's a yeah, they're going to stop responding they oh they'll respond oh they'll respond <laughs> yes it'll just be a, a different response yes. i think council scott to address part of your part of your issue is that ron and, and jason have been challenged to evaluate that and we're going to look at that um, right now however a lot of our capital is being kind of saved and we're scrimping to yeah. ensure that we can try to hold the rates and put as much of that capital towards the water treatment plant so that we can keep those water rates down. Once that plant is done and we know exactly where that is and some of that capital is freed up to start doing the projects again, I think that issue becomes much more relevant. But hopefully we'll have the answers before that happens. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's basically uh, exactly what we're looking at. So. Uh, moving on, operations and management. Um, so one of the things that uh, uh, we asked for Carrillo to do was to determine the O&M cost of this new treatment plant. What's it going to take to operate, maintain this new treatment plant? Uh, is it the most cost effective way with city staff or is the most cost effective way with uh, our current contractor? Uh, w what is that? Uh, Tell us what you think there. And so they're working through that process. And um, when when we get a contract with them, that, that'll be one of the big pieces in the scope. And I just want to let you know that that is something that we are looking at. I think it's, it's, it's warrants looking at. Uh, not that our current contractor doesn't do a great job, but I think it would be prudent for us to always keep that in, my, in the back of our head. You know, what it, what is the best, sure. you know? Um, so, a couple other things we're looking at for uh, uh, operations, um, alternate power, whether, whether it's effective or not, um, you know, different types of building, green building, that type of stuff. So, so those will all be looked at as well when, when we get to that point. Um, sub consultants, I stuck this section in there uh, just basically to give everybody an idea that Corolla kind of stuck to their word um, with... Um, who they actually went and um, selected to do all of the sub-consulting work. And that's Udale Engineering, Irwin Consulting Engineers, Foundation Engineering, and Crawford Land Survey. So every 
private business that we have that's an engineer land surveying here in town has, has gotten a piece of this work too. So uh, we were pretty happy that they stuck with that. And that they, they did that on their own. We did not dictate that as staff. Um, they, they did that on their own, so it should be noted. Uh, and then I guess the summary, um, you know, and we've kind of beat it up a little bit, um, trying to define a scope that fits within our existing funding and doesn't sacrifice our quality capacity or our operations and maintenance. Um, I think that's the, the number one takeaway from this is um, there may come a point when we say, well, we can't get what we want with the funding mechanism that we have in place right now and we may have to come back to this body and say, well, we need X percentage in order to move this thing forward. Uh, and I guess to keep in mind, we're, we're uh, original cost were 25 million, you know, and that was that was four to six years ago, and then now we're looking at 75% um, of the initial rates that were looked at for funding this capital project. So keep that in mind uh, as we're going through this. Um, it's important to us, though, as staff, that we try and do this. Uh, that's one of the goals that we've set, actually, as uh, public works department is. Uh, we're just going to keep banging on it until we get it to where we want it, you know, and we're hoping that we get it there so that we don't, we don't, uh, we don't have to come back with that existing rate increase or that additional rate increase. Uh, but again, we'll probably propose a minimum 3% next year uh, and a 3% over the following year. That's a minimum. Um, so keep those as a minimum. Uh, I think if there's anything more than that, we definitely have a pretty good discussion about it. Um, you know, prior to, uh, we'll definitely do another work session when we get a contract back that we can use. So. We talked about an, an initially an increase every year anyway. Correct. So the three percent you're you're saying we're probably going to need the next two years is on top of no, just a three. I'm just saying, please at least look at doing the inflationary. We did not this year, and, right. and there was a reason we didn't, and and. I basically told you that with the staff reductions that we had and who was staffed in water and how that worked out that we and until we really knew more like a three percent inflationary yeah. so we didn't lose anything this year but okay. what what we're we're saying at this point is is you know whether that CPI next year is 2.3 or 2.1 probably at a minimum we're looking at three for sure you know, and maybe it's four. I don't know. In order to get us down that path, so we get we we'll get that plan. But one of the other interesting things that I think uh, we've talked about as staff is probably pushing out the construction of the the water treatment plant maybe four to six months. And what that does is it allows us to capture another year's worth of cash from rates, which thus lowers your bond, your debt service. And that four to six months, if we can time it right, is not going to make a big deal, uh, you know, one way or the other. I say that now, as long as the, tre the existing treatment plant right. doesn't crash, you know. Um, but that, that's, that's one of the things we're looking at. And, and that will cut our, our debt service uh, there again. So we're, we're trying to factor that in as well. So. Ron, anyway, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Could you, at some point, I don't need to write the second or immediately, but could you get for us the maybe actual calculations that showed how we arrived at 25 and a half million and the you know just the actual numbers as opposed to the end conclusions yeah they're in the they're in the master plan it's it's in the back back here yeah what what ch Tom hill used for their for their numbers it's in the very back okay then i'll just take a look yeah. at that then i can bring them to you no I'll, problem is that the same master plan you've given me yes before? it is I'll yes. Take a it's the that. it's the uh, capital system improvements yeah no, okay i'll take a look at that <clears throat> What other questions? Anything else? Other than that some of us wanted this thing built already, but hey. <laughs> <laughs> we could have done one sixty percent rate increase, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> that was on the table. I know it was. Yeah. I know it was. Um, no, I think I think uh, you've done right with, with the rates. I think that was the, the right move still. I know you uh, we may have to, to add to them a little bit, but until we know that dollar number, uh, I don't think any of us as staff would feel right coming before this body and saying, yeah, just do 15 or just do 10 and, right. and, and not having a, a, 
a basis for that. And even if it, even if our next increase is seven or eight percent, right. I mean, I'm okay with that because we didn't do the 15 before we had enough information to right. make a to make a you know a, a, a good decision on that. Eight still hard to swallow, and still people are going to be ticked. Yeah. But if you can show exactly why we need it, then I'm then I'm behind it. That's that's our three. Goal. Awesome. Yeah. That's our goal. You know, so. Just to finalize, you know, council is aware that we've we've had this on the agenda a few times to actually try to finalize the contract. And Ron and his, his folks, we've sat down and said, you know, we're not quite where we want to be with the numbers yet. And our goal is to build the best system we can that will serve the future needs of the city with as little ongoing cost while we can keep the rates fairly level into the future and build those capital reserves to replace and maintain that equipment down the line. Exactly, and, and because Ron's the whole thing is we don't want to be in the position, you know, 50 years from now that, that we are in right now because we didn't have the long-term foresight to just continue to build enough capital to be in a position, you know, this is going to, it's going to have a life span 50 years from now god only knows what deq is going to say we you know we can only drink mist from the sky or you know something probably have uh, to put it under a bubble or something yeah, yeah there's yeah good lord um so it, it, whatever we do today may be completely inadequate then absolutely we have to plan for that absolutely okay and anybody that wants more information i mean we've got I mean, come see us. Set up, set up a time. We'd love to go through this with you in more depth. And They're more talking detail. to you, Barry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we could we could bore you to tears with it if you want. You so. already did. Okay, <laughs> I, my work here is done. It, it gets worse. Actually, right. thank you for all you guys' hard work on this. Okay. I know it's all a big right. project. Well, we'll keep working at it. Thank you. Thanks. Let's take a five-minute break and then we'll move on to the city hall facilities. Okay, let's get started back with the work session. City Hall Facilities, Dana, City Manager. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Council Members. Um, you know, I was greeted by what I can only assume was John Nelson's subtle hint to me that there were some issues when I arrived on the first day and there was an instruction book to an earthquake monitor on the middle of my chair. And I started asking people, what is, what is this? Of all, you know, I'd heard about the rain and all this, and suddenly it was this earthquake issue. And people started to talk about, oh yeah, you know our, our building is going to collapse if there's an earthquake. And I started wondering and started looking, and, and I believe you were directed by uh, Linda to some material on the internet, in particular referring to a 1994 study and a draft study done in 2012. Uh, and I believe Jamie brought you some hard copies. And essentially both of those studies, um, now covering a period of almost 19 years, have essentially said we have even a moderate seismic event and our city hall is, is going to be rubble. Um, that causes me some level of concern. Uh, and I've started to look at what can we do? What really are our needs uh, regarding City Hall? And before I got too far, I wanted to make sure that, that I understood the pulse of council on what was important to them in a City Hall, um, whether they even agreed that, yeah, we should probably look and at what the options are, or uh, if council was pretty much like, ah, we'll pull the dead bodies out of the rubble when it happens and worry about everything later. Well, so that's staff. Kind, of, kind of the discussion point now. Um, and when and if we get to uh, some of the options I've identified that really relate to specific locations and pros and cons, I think we would need to uh, convene to executive session. Yeah, I have to say, uh, I'd heard some of the discussion from John Hitt back last year when we were talking about it, and uh, I hadn't read the report until just you know a couple of days ago, and I was I was pretty shocked at how how bad the buildings are, the different sizes, heights of the buildings altogether, the fact that they will all collapse on each other because of the different sizes, because there's essentially three buildings there. It's it's pretty serious. Well, I, I if I remember correctly, it was in the late. 90s there there was a, at least one day that the the building was evacuated because of anticipated high winds um, 
that did indeed come through, but not quite as strong as they had expected. But there was reason to believe back then that that was a threat. Hmm. Well, so what you're basically saying is that City Hall is unsafe. Therefore, we need to do something about it in some fashion to make it safe for the folks that work there. And possibilities are fix it and you know repair it, which is expensive. Um, tear it down, get rid of it, and buy it or build a new building. Or farm staff out to other locations around the city, and maybe some other options I haven't thought of. That seems to be the basic picture. In other words, the, it, am I correct in hearing you that we don't feel like we have a lot of options as far as dealing with the problem in some form? Well, ultimately, what I want to do is bring you back options, and that's when you'd actually have to make a decision. Today is just kind of a work session to get your input. I don't want to bring options back that nobody has any interest in whatsoever. Um, from, from my perspective, there are certain things that are important in a city hall, uh, and that is there has to be a creation of a sense of community, a, a gathering place, a place where people think they can come and uh, address their issues with the city, whether it be with the city council or with city staff. Um, I know that this council has expressed concern about this facility as a city chambers. Um, I think it's very quaint, but not necessarily the most accessible or the most uh, fitting of a government body such as yourselves for citizens to feel comfortable coming in and addressing the council. Certainly our current building isn't exactly comfortable for people to come into a, a fairly small waiting room. Um, issues with potential security with completely open windows and, and things like that. Um, so I, I don't know what's important to each of you relative to the kinds of things I, I should consider if all you're really thinking is, you know what, we just need an austere rectangular building that serves a functional purpose, then I will look at certain types of options. If on the other hand you're thinking that it should be something that uh, is illustrative of the community values and open space and, and that feeling of community, then I think that there are other types of options that may or may not involve larger parcels of land or, or other locations. So really I'm kind of looking for that guidance in, in just an open discussion here. And then uh, again, I'd like to go to executive session if the mayor is uh, willing to discuss some specific locations that I've looked at that are potential options for uh, expansion should we choose to go that way I would like to see us I would like to see us have something representative of uh, our more recent you know the library and the the, the senior center the, the uh, justice, justice center, center. Um, I think it should have. I think it should have a more accommodating facility for uh, public meetings, and I think it should be something. You know, we we have this uh, momentum of people in Lebanon really feeling proud of Lebanon, and really feeling like we got it going on compared to uh, uh, most other communities in Oregon, and I think it should be representative of that. Well, I completely concur with that sentiment. I really do. Um, the idea that, I mean, if you look historically, communities have always been proud of their public edifices. You know, clear back to Greece and Rome. It's, it's, you know, to build an edifice that represents and, and promotes the community as a entity is, is a good thing. And so I, I concur with you. The other sentiment that comes out is, is that, um, you know, we need to keep in mind what it costs the citizens that live here to do this. I mean, ancient Greece bankrupt themselves building the Parthenon, and we don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. And so, somehow we're going to, to strike a, a balance of those desires and, and or be really creative and get them all accomplished. But, um, you know, we're trying to build a water treatment plant right now that we're struggling to figure out how to afford. Mm -hmm. and, and to tack on a city hall right now, at first blush sounds difficult. Now I'm not ready to say we can't figure out a way to do the impossible, so let's not, I'm not saying that, but let's keep in mind that we need to keep the cost of living in this community on the downward trend, not the upward trend. I think if we could come to, if nothing else, if we could come to a consensus that status quo on City Hall right now as it sits is not, I've, I don't find it acceptable. If it's life-threatening, that's clearly the case. It's not acceptable. We have a real liability if we let it go too long and we've known this for yeah. right. years. But, and you know, we've solved any problem throwing enough money at it. Yeah. 
So we got to be right. careful with that as well. Right, and that, that's a concern that I have. I don't want to see. When I read this report, I mean, this both engineers basically are saying that it's it's just cost prohibitive to make this building workable. It really needs to be torn down and rebuilt or somewhere else. So, I'm I don't feel comfortable trying to fix this building. Well, and I really think even uh, trying to build something else on that site and tear it down is really limited to the scope of where our city is growing. That's probably small already. So. I, I agree with you to, to throw money at that building. It served us well. I mean, it was a fire department for a while and a <laughs> police, police station and, and a city hall, et cetera. Uh, I think the section where the fire department was, I heard, used to be the old, uh, they used to feed uh, some of the horses or something in there. It was like a <laughs> stall part or something. It has served us well. So I would say, you know, to limit it down, I would I would throw that in as a retrofit, or or even using that site might be out of the question in my mind. Okay. I have a few things as I jotted down here. Um, I think the first thing we have to think about are the citizens that have to pay for it, like Barry said, and and if they're going to pay for something, they need to support it. They, they're going to want to have to support it. Therefore, I think that. The education of our citizens on the condition of this is of utmost importance. Um, they need to know, and we need to shout it from the rooftops. Really, how if it's this bad, and this looks bad? If it's that bad, then we need to let them know. That raises another question, which is, what is our obligation as an employer for the people who, yourself included, who work in there on a day in and day out basis? Uh, if we have a known threat or a known uh, safety issue like that. I mean, we won't let a guy get off of a truck without a safety vest on, but we're going to sh shuttle these people into this building for the next two to three years, knowing that one wind event could take it down. And we certainly get our share of those here. Uh, so w what is that obligation? And if we're going to go look at this, then obviously we're not we're not pulling this out of some line item in the budget somewhere. We're going to have to go to bond on this and and find a, a funding source for it. What's that cost going to be? What, And then what other structures do we have right now that may be in the same boat? If, if that building is the same, uh, the first one that popped in my head was the, the maintenance shop building down there. How, how stable is that? Yeah. Uh, I know we've got a new justice center. We've got a new library. We've got a senior center that's old, but I'm assuming is in good shape, but I don't know that. Um, what other structures do we have? Uh, I'm not sure, but so is there a potential to have to lump lump another structure into this to make so we don't fund a city hall and then turn around and two years later, oh by the way, the maintenance shops are falling down. Let's let's go through this whole dog and pony show again. So uh, I think if we if we want to have the support of the citizens when it comes time to vote on this, we need to give them all the information that we have and present the best possible <coughs> package for them. And then it's really up to them at that point. And then the alternative is up to you. <laughs> so. okay. That's fair. At uh, one time, we looked at the telephone office. Now, I guess that's dead, isn't it? Uh, that we kind of pulled away from that. It's off the market. We've got a couple of... Um, car dealership buildings in town that are empty. Would there be any feasibility of doing anything with those? I think we need to, we, that would be for executive session. That, oh, that oh part. okay. And, okay. Uh, and, and then we'll go with the generalities now and then if we okay. need any specific locations. So at least at this point what I'm hearing relative to consensus is it, it's not, fixing the current building isn't really uh, an option oh. for say that seems pretty clear no. yeah that there has to be citizens it support. Cost you twice as much as what it would do to build something new but. yeah to me the, the question is is you know what do you where do you put people next yeah. and the question there is you know do you build something new which brings all the funding issues up or you know do we take existing facilities and start parsing people out as a stopgap you know somewhere in that spectrum is probably the answer but getting them out of a facility that's unsafe is probably Seems to be a consensus. I know for a while too we rented some office space. Yeah, uh, I mean, there, there may be several v ways of moving forward, but if it's unsafe, it's unsafe. You certainly always move everyone to the Justice Center, right? There you go. So, yeah. so <laughs> thank you, Councilor Boland. I think Linda's going to very helpful. Yeah. So there's 
there's I think there's two issues. I think one is the immediate issue that we need to look at to make sure that the safety of the employees and the building that that's taken care of, and then the secondary I think is a, a permanent location, a final location. I think those are the two. Yes, and if we do some sort of if we come to some sort of you know farming people out and renting places. Um, that that isn't a good 10-year plan, say, you know, what, whatever. If, if we, yeah, if we, if we do some repair. sort of stopgap measure, then what is our what is our real plan? Yeah, we need a real plan. It might have period. to be a, but if we don't have support to move forward with it, yeah. we may move them out for the sake of safety in the short term. But if the community's vision doesn't match ours then there is no long-term. Once you go well, door that's to reality, door, you're going to... You know, the, the, like we, I think we've already agreed that, you know, putting folks where they're safe is top priority. Absolutely. And I think we can do that. And if, we, if the community says we're happy with them spread out, well, that's the community's choice. But I don't think it will be. I think, I think the community... My sense is that this community and most communities, if presented with what is necessary, will pony up. I think what we need to be careful of is making sure it's really necessary and we've done it in a responsible way. Right. Yeah. I think, I think if, you know, if we go to the community and say this really is important, it's necessary, I think the folks will say, go ahead. It's hard to argue with. They, they typically back that. what needs to happen. So, But I don't want to go to them and say let's build a, you know, a brand new Taj Mahal City Hall because we really need it if there's some other way. Right. Well, in a year ago, two years ago, that the conversation I think would have would have sounded differently than it would today in the public for a variety of reasons. I agree. I guess the, the two other issues that I just want to kind of touch on and then I think we'd need to recess to, to executive session to discuss any specifics, but one is the council's feeling on the general location of where City Hall should be. We have the downtown, we have a new developing area on the north, we have a developing area on the south, and I'm not quite sure how council feels about the, the general area that City Hall should be, or if there is a preference or no preference. Well, if I, had, if I could just pick it from personal preference, I would say somewhere in the in the Academy Square area, you know, that seems to be the area in which our civic buildings are developing in a nice way, and that's accessible. It meets everything. You know, you could spread the city influence around the community in some fashion, but I think there's some merit in having a, a core of of municipal function. That's, that's my and, personal opinion. And, and just because you mentioned a specific one, but fortunately it was a city-owned property, um, just to. Che and I had so talked about this before, not to talk about any specific potential general. property locations, sure. but just I, I was general. saying that side as much no. as that part of town, okay. where I'm, you know, as opposed to clear out the south into town somewhere. Right. I have I have received some feedback from people on this, and uh, I'm like Barry. I kind of think that Academy Square is a nice area. We've got the Justice Center, and I think it'd be nice to kind of keep that all together. And it could be near Main Street, so it's still fairly close. Uh, but I've also received some comments, some feedback from people uh, saying to keep it downtown more where it is. Yeah. Not, not right where it is necessarily, even on 2nd Street, but somewhere in that downtown core that's a little further downtown. So I've just, yeah. I just heard both sides. Mm -hmm. Well, and I would say that uh, I think I've heard some similar things through the years, but also if we're talking about being really open-minded, if there was a compelling case to go outside of those parameters, I think I'd be I'd want to hear about it sure. to, to entertain it. I think so with the people. I agree. I think we yeah. need to look at all the possibilities. Yeah, I agree. Like if like if Jason said, if it, if it turns out that really it would be best because the, the 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 maintenance building is also failing or is close or you know we're that's within a five year consideration and we were going to do we were going to consolidate those i could say you know i could justify moving the moving it to the south end of town because we're that's the only place say that we could combine those facilities and and really get the best bang for our buck without having to to spend more money so i i have heard people say oh, it's great to have a downtown which is awesome for people who are downtown it would be great to have it out there if there was a compelling reason i could have it in the south so i'm the truth is, Lebanon is not so big that accessibility is going to be a problem. It, yeah, this isn't Portland. It's yeah. not the you, you know, you, wherever you put it is going to be out of somebody's way, and 
and more convenient for somebody else. Yeah, it could go from three minutes to five minutes away. So downtown would be awesome, but I, I think a case could be made for almost anywhere if the price was right. Especially with the price, exactly, and that's, you know, that's where that comes in. And we'll obviously explore that later in executive, but. Why couldn't we just knock down the building we got there now and rebuild on that spot eventually? I don't, don't know that's, that's be not right in the area. And also, I believe when the first uh, talk came out about the new library, wasn't there property right over here that we were thinking about putting the library on right across the street? Don't, doesn't the city own that lot? Are you looking at me? Yes. No. <laughs> I've heard that we do, but I, I don't know for sure. That wouldn't be a bad There are location. some other city properties in yeah. the downtown well, area we that we do own. Yeah. 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 yeah, most of that's executive. Well, I, I mean, I would say actually, if in, I mean, if you're talking about city-owned already property, I'm not as concerned about that for executive session. I mean, just so we're very clear on what's appropriate and what's not for executive session, because I don't want to be cutting people off and, and, and not being sure about what we can talk about. What we're trying to do is simply keep the city at a competitive advantage with other private parties. In other words, if the city has to go out there and say, hey, you know, we're looking at building this lot, and that lot suddenly appears to go up, you know, in price by 30 percent, that's not what um, is fair. And so the executive session is basically the purpose is to talk to specific par specific parcels that we may be interested whether it be a lease or a purchase or anything like that and even areas around that that we may have to purchase for parking or something like that so that's the kind of discussion that we want to reserve for executive sure. session so that we don't put ourselves as a city in an economic competitive disadvantage because of the public meeting laws and the open meeting laws and that kind of stuff so just so you understand the parameters of what we can and can should should and should not discuss in executive session that's kind of the parameter so if we're talking about city owned property that we already own and that being an option I'm fine discussing that in this we should in fact discuss that in this executive session because I don't I don't see that following falling into that executive session parameter so but to answer your question I have no idea what that property is okay <laughs> and whether we talked about it or not I don't remember that was a long time ago yeah I remember a lot of properties were discussed then yeah well, if we, if we wanted to talk about some specific locations, I think we'd have to reconvene to, to executive. Did, did you want to talk any more about feel or, you know, as far as the, the type of facility, or is that something you'd rather wait for later? Well, again, I, th I think I've gotten the sense that everybody agrees that a town hall or city hall should have a sense of community and a sense of community feel, and I think that's something that we would have to consider relative to the size of whatever parcel we were going to be dealing with. Um, that we couldn't get a, a half acre parcel that would literally just be the footprint of the building and not be able to provide some sort of feel. So, and one of the things, uh, when I was speaking to Dana, we were talking about it in, uh, you know, we were talking about the, the feel of a, of a city hall. And do you want just this flat building that you really go up to and you go in and out and that's it? Or do you want something that maybe has a little bit of an entryway or a courtyard or something where people could actually assemble or come in and feel like part of the community? So I think that knowing how we built the library and the Justice Center and how nice those buildings are and the entryways and things, and I, I think that's the way I would like to see it go, is that direction, is so that it's a comfortable, it's a community, it's it's everybody's building, it's not some big palace. Too much room for protesters, because you don't want to make them too comfortable. And you can't protest because you're on city council. <laughs> yeah. Well, and also I think that those two buildings um, were built soundly, and they were built with a little bit of flair, but not over the top. Mm -hmm. And I would hate to see like a pole barn looking thing because there's lots <laughs> to be proud of that. Uh, but I think we struck a really good balance with those two buildings. And I think they'll serve as well for a long time. And if that sort of mentality was behind construction, I think we'd hit a home run with the people too. And they were, the, the thought process was really, uh, you know, stay with the brick look, say. I mean, that, that wasn't outrageously expensive, but it was, it was historically, uh, you know, closer to the the original building that was on. You know, the, they were trying to stay true to the high school look, and it was awesome that the medical college then kind of did the same thing. So we kind of have a little corridor of um, more historically 
I don't want to say accurate, but but the, they have the flavor of the older buildings. Yeah. A little classy. Just, yeah, a little yeah. bit, without being outrageous. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Did you want to move into? Okay. At this point, then we will adjourn the work session, and uh, if we could clear the room, and we'll go into executive session.